Well, I think that what we do is very impulsive, especially what we do on stage. You know, it's uh, things happen that are based on uh, just that particular moment. The our show is a combination of pieces that we have rehearsed, which include blank spots during which anything can happen, and the things that happen are based on what what happened to you that day when you woke up, or what happened on your way to the show, or what the audience is doing, or or something like that. So. Uh, the whole environment that I live in is part of the impulse that creates the music. Well, did your schooling have, a, have any effect on your way of thinking or musical thinking? Uh, yes, my schooling had a great effect on my musical thinking. Positive, negative? <laughs> It was all negative. <laughs> well, you were very avant-garde, at least the American way, when you performed your bicycle concerto. Uh, do you consider yourself avant-garde now? Do I consider my... Yes, I'm very avant-garde right now. I am about as avant-garde as I have ever been, right at this very moment. Jazz has had bad experiences when connected with classical music. So has rock in recent years. How is the relationship between Zappa and classics? Uh, you tell me about the classic and I'll tell you about my relationship. What particular classic do you mean? Well, I mean... Uh, Just a combination of rock and serious writing? Yeah, serious writing is the, the word. The basic problem of combining rock music with serious writing is whenever it's been done, it's been done for a sensational exploitation type situation, uh, a special concert perhaps, where uh, I, I have been involved in one thing with the Los Angeles Philharmonic where they used the rock group to bring an audience to the orchestra which was having trouble getting an audience oh. and uh, what usually happens is the orchestra does not play with the same intensity emotional intensity as the rock group that is there and so the the performance never really comes off and then you have acoustical problems of balancing the volume of the electric group against the uh, acoustic group and so forth is that too technical No, no, not at all. You seem, seem to be the only rock personality interested in modernist, I mean, like uh, Varese and uh, uh, Stravinsky. Mm -hmm. you, and, um, how do you see and what do you think of their elements? How can you use them? Well, see, I'm not the only person who might be interested in Stravinsky. There are probably some others in rock now who are interested in, in that kind of music, but I believe I was the first one to bring those composers to the attention of a, a young record-buying public. And the thing that uh, I enjoy about those composers is the harmonic language is, is a lot more interesting than uh, the normal harmonic language that is used in pop music. Like, uh, you know how rock and roll is constructed? You get a guy with a guitar, see, and he knows if he's starting, He knows one, two, or maybe three chords. If he's been playing for a few years, he knows 10, 20, maybe 30 chords. The chords themselves are not interesting because, you know, they're standard positions that you put your hand in on the guitar. See, so when songs are made up out of standard things like that, they will tend to sound repetitive, you know, they'll always be the same. So if you're writing for a group of instruments, and each person in that group gets to play one note of a chord that gives you the chance to make the chord any density that you like you know it can be like this it can be like that it can be spread out like that and uh, you can only do that by working with uh, many instruments and uh, different tone colors and so that's what I have uh, come to appreciate in especially in the writing of Vares is the uh, tone colors and the voicings of the chords. How did you find the first mothers? They were working in a bar, a beer bar, called the uh, Broadside in Pomona, California. Did they play anything? Did they play anything? Yes, I mean instruments. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, they, w they were playing instruments at the time, see. Uh, I got a phone call from Ray Collins, who is the lead singer from this group. Now, I had worked with Ray several times on records in 63. 
and he was working in this band at this bar and they had a guitar player and Ray and the guitar player had a fist fight and he beat the guitar player up and they didn't have a guitar player so they called me and asked me to come down and substitute so I went down there and I said I would look at the band and see if I wanted to play with it and I thought they were okay it was Ray Collins on vocals and harmonica Roy Estrada on bass Jimmy Carl Black on drums and a guy named Davey Coronado on tenor sax and Davey was pretty much leading the band see. So I got in there and I said, well, you know, we'll never get anywhere working in this beer bar. Let's learn some original material and go make records. And Davy Coronado said, no, if you play original material, you'll get fired from these beer joints, you know, because in those places they only want you to play what's on the radio. So uh, I talked them into playing some original stuff and Davy quit. And he's still working in a beer joint someplace in, in California. And then we got fired, because Davey was right, you know. <laughs> and we kept getting fired for about a year until we finally made a record. Mm -hmm. You had some difficulties with the name of the band. Yeah, because uh, the record company that finally signed us uh, didn't want to sign a contract with a group called The Mothers. Why? Because, uh, do you want the real reason or you want yes. a television reason? No, not real. real reason. In the United States, uh, the term mother is short for motherfucker, and the term motherfucker can be used a variety of ways. One way it means somebody who stuffs it up their mother, and another way it means a musician who is supposedly good on his instrument. And at the time, in the place where we were working, all the guys who were in the group were the best available in Pomona. Does that give you a rough idea of how sad it was in Pomona in those days? So I thought we should call the group the Mothers, which is, you know, as I explained, short for that other word. So the record company said, no, you'll never be able to sell any records like that. And uh, they said, if you don't change the name of the group, we're not going to give you a contract. And they wanted to call it the Mothers Auxiliary, which is a name that is usually attached to parent organizations in, in the States. So uh, I said, no, out of necessity, we will become the Mothers of Invention. Plato. That's right. That's where it came from. Were Mothers the only bands that uh, started uh, to um, to put political and social comments as a part of the stage act and music? And we were the first one to do it, first group to do it. There were other groups who did it, and they did it for the wrong reasons, I think. The Jefferson Airplane did it to make money, and the MC5 did it to be sensational. And you were... We just did it because, as a matter of fact, most of the rest of the guys in the group didn't want to do it. I was, uh, I had many arguments with Ray Collins, who was the lead singer of the group, about the lyrics to the songs. He didn't want to say those things, you know. Does Zappa music sell better now than five or six years ago? Uh, it sells faster. I think our biggest selling record, two biggest selling records, are Freak Out and Hot Rats. Freak Out because it's been available for almost 10 years, and Hot Rats because it sells steadily month after month and has uh, sold um, a large quantity of records over a long period of time. With the last two LPs, uh, sold fast but did not sell as much as the others. Do you think that they are public as grown up to understand your music better than well I should think that after 10 years that they would get used to it a little bit more you know, I don't know whether they understand it better but it's not so shocking to them to see some of the things that we do music that you play is it uh, heavily scored or is it largely uh, built around you know, pre-arranged patterns 50% uh, of the things that we play are completely scored out up to and including all the beats that the drums are supposed to play and uh, inside of those scored pieces, there are spaces left open for instrumental improvisation, much as you would in a normal jazz context. And the rest of the show is pieces that are either uh, so simple that you wouldn't bother to write them down, and you just hum them to the other musicians and they would pick it up, or else uh, they're completely improvised. We try during each show to improvise one piece 100%. To, to get musicians to play this sort of material, do you find it difficult at all? It's, it's one of the hardest things I ever had to do. 
Why? Because they're, they're not used to reading scores? No. Uh, you can always find musicians who can read, and there are plenty of very good reading musicians around, but you, the people that I like to find have to have these requisites. One, a sense of humor. Two, extreme musical ability in a legitimate sense. They should be able to manipulate their instrument with a great deal of proficiency and be able to read music because that saves time in learning how to play the stuff. And they also have to be able to feel some sort of uh, blues roots, you know, because most of the stuff that I've written, no matter how weird or complicated it might sound on top, it has some sort of rhythm and blues lurking in the background. And if the musician doesn't have some sort of uh, appreciation of that kind of music, then the performance doesn't come off right. What sort of blues, uh, you say blues roots, what sort of blues musicians have interested you? Well, my three favorite guitar players of all time are Johnny Guitar Watson, Guitar Slim, and Clarence Gatemouth Brown. And my favorite blues singers are uh, Little Willie John, and Howlin' Wolf, and Muddy Waters. Light and slim. With uh, albums like Live at the Fulmore and Just Another Band from LA, have you ever had any censorship problems with what's on the albums? Um, well, the history of the Mothers of Invention has been fraught with censorship problems, and these result when uh, somebody has been employed by somebody else to determine what's best for the public at large, which I think is just a terrible job for anybody to have to live up to. But uh, the first company that we were signed with, MGM Verve, did some bad things to our albums, just randomly chopping things out that they didn't understand. That if they couldn't understand something, they presumed it to be uh, obscene, so they would cut it out. And that spoiled a lot of the, the work that we did for that label. So then we changed to uh, a special deal with uh, WEA, and we haven't had any censorship problems with them until... I got to Australia and went to a press conference yesterday, and during the press conference they were playing some of our albums, and I noticed that the Uncle Meat album had been censored, and uh, they're not supposed to do that. Shouldn't, shouldn't be done. I also heard that the uh, Australian release of the soundtrack for 200 Motels has also been censored. And just to give you an idea of uh, the type of censorship that you're involved in, the only other countries in the world where 200 Motels have been censored are Spain, Portugal, and Brazil, so you, you people are in trouble. You got to get rid of this censorship stuff. It's, it's not going to do you any good at all. The stories in those particular two albums are, are they real stories? They're all true. Even the bit about the gremlin. That's true. The gremlin is true. Yeah. And the mud shark story. The mud shark story is true. For those of you who don't know what these stories are, you'll have to get the album and find out what he's talking about. If you do know, they're true. <laughs> really was a mud shark. There still are mud sharks. We have actually gone fishing for mud sharks ourselves at that same hotel. <laughs> Not only that, I have an interview on tape with the, um, he was the desk clerk at this place. It's called the Edgewater Inn in Seattle, Washington. And I, I interviewed this man and asked him technical questions about how many mud sharks they find per week in the beds and, you know, who uses mud sharks and what do they use them for. And, and his answers were, uh, sort of amazing because I presumed that sexual activities involving a, a large rough surfaced fish is a, sort of a thing that only a rock and roll group would get into but he says no 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 that regular straight life tourists also use mud sharks here at the hotel. Mater with material for pieces like um, the mud shark and, and Billy the Mountain and that, well, they just come out of your day-to-day -day living and people sure. are meeting that? Yeah, well, I think that everybody who writes songs must extract what the, the text of his song from some personal experience. And it just so happens that the way I live my life and the people that I know give me access to types of experiences that are unusual by some standards. So I just write them down and try and share them with other people who may be interested in sharing those unusual experiences because maybe they don't have time to go to the Edgewater Inn and have fun with the mud shark. So we just, it's like helping the shut-ins, you know? What, uh, what first turned you on to the idea of the music that you started with Hot Rats, the Hot Rats album? Well, up until that time, the main drawback that that I could see with most of the Mother's albums prior to the Hot Rats album was the fact that the rhythm section didn't really get off the ground. You know, there, Jimmy Carl Black was okay as a drummer and Art Tripp was okay as a drummer and Billy Monday was okay as a drummer, but 
none of them were really, uh, you know, hard driving, you know, make you really want to tap your foot. And rather than fire them simply because they weren't hard driving, because we'd all worked together for such a long time, I kept them around and, you know, we're all good friends and we stayed in the band together, but I think the band suffered from lack of having a good beat. So the, my first venture into an album with a good beat was the Hot Rats thing, and at least 50% of what's on that album is foot-tappable material. And you're going to extend this idea further and further? Well, since the time that uh, the first group of mothers broke up, I've looked around for drummers that had foot-tapping ability. Ainsley Dunbar certainly had it, in an abstract way. <coughs> and. Uh, Ralph Humphrey, the drummer that's with us now, certainly has it in an abstract way. Uh, you never know in the future I might get something that's even more basic and primitive. <laughs> Throbbing, lewd, pulsating rhythms. Are you going to have to listen to any of the Aboriginal music here in Australia? Depends on what the schedule is like. If, if today is any indication of what my schedule is going to be like, no, I won't get a chance to hear any of it. Frank, uh, 200 motels is unlikely to be released here. Um, because of censorship requirements. You've got another film, Uncle Meat, uh, still on film and uncut. Is that likely to be edited? Uh, one day I might finish that, yeah. Well, have you any more film projects in mind? I want to make a science fiction movie. Any any idea of a plot line for it? It has a giant spider in it and has a woman eight feet tall. It has a con man from the earth who is a religious fanatic. That's a musical. <laughs> right. The usual stuff, you know. <laughs> Regular. Uh... Um, what, what about uh, Reuben and the Jets? You've got another Reuben and the Jets band on the road, although you're not closely associated with them personally. Uh, what are they doing at the moment? Uh, I believe they're touring with a group called Three Dog Night, and they're about to go to Europe probably in August. Mm. Are you keeping a very... Um, close eye on what they do, or is it something? Well, I advise them from time to time. I helped them get the group together, and I produced their first album. And uh, occasionally they have little intra-band squabbles, and I sit there and act like a union mediator or something, <laughs> arbitrator. <clears throat> what, what particularly, you know, what made you get a, a, the first Reuben and the Jets together? So, well. As I told you before, I always liked rhythm and blues music, and that's just another kind of rhythm and blues music. Yeah. Did you? Uh, there was some reportage around that uh, you were getting it together in an attempt to make a commercial success out of your music. <laughs> well, if you can imagine, in 1967, releasing well, it was recorded in 67 and released in 68. If you can imagine releasing an album like that and seriously thinking that that was going to be commercial, you'd see the humor in that statement. It's, you don't get very much airplay on top 40 stations. You don't get any at all as far as in Australia, and I wouldn't imagine you get terribly much overseas. Um, this, is commercial success important to you other than making enough money to do what you want to do? Well, commercial success uh, represents two things. One, it represents dollars and cents, and two, it represents reaching a large audience. Um, the dollars and cents I'm comfortable with right now because I managed to make enough from the concert tours and so forth, publishing, uh, to pay for the equipment that I use and to pay the people who are making the music. <clears throat> but uh, the problem about reaching a larger audience is uh, it's important to me because more people know my face from a poster or from doing an interview on television or uh, radio or magazine than have ever heard the albums or have ever seen the group live. You know, so it makes you wonder. I, I'm famous, but most people don't even know what I do. Zappa and the Mothers of Invention took 60s rock and roll through a whole lot of mutations. You were responsible for what then was called the underground in the 1960s. You were part of that formation of that whole thing that was happening then. Now in the 1980s in, in music, it's very much above ground. It's changed a whole lot, hasn't it? Well, it's changed, but I don't know, know what you mean by underground and above ground. What, what commodity are we talking about that is above the ground and under the ground? You're talking yeah. about explicit sexual lyrics in rock records? In we'll particular? talk about that. <laughs> no, no, that's not what I'm talking about. Actually, that's part of it. No, part of what you offered and the Mothers of Invention offered was an alternative to the monkeys and the turtles. 
Well, you know, su surprising to find out that there is uh, actually an alternative to the monkeys and the turtles. Uh, and of course, once the turtles uh, joined the Mothers of Invention, it became obvious that they could do both. But um, there's not too much alternative to the stuff that is being broadcast today. This is what I was going to ask you, is that now you see that radio has changed dramatically in the last, even in the last 10 years. There's not as much outlet for creativity on well, the radio. Here's what happened. Here's, here's radio history, okay? It, rock and roll is what, 35 years old, something like that, 40 years old maybe. Um, a few guys played shows that were one or two hours long on certain days of the week, playing certain types of records. It started off like that, and then grew and grew and grew until an entire station formats were dedicated to rock, but it was AM. And it became incredibly corrupt, and people were being handed cash to play certain records, and certain people became stars, and other people became uh, busboys, irrelevant of what the musical merits were. If you paid off, you got to be a star. And so then they had payola scandals. Somewhere in the 60s, somebody says, well, let's put some of this on FM, which was generally reserved for that mysterious signal that enters the dentist office when you're not looking. And on FM, you could do it in stereo. So since there weren't that many people listening and uh, there wasn't that much pressure, the FM stations were very creative. You were involved in some of that. And you could play what you wanted, and you could make an art form out of your own broadcast. Every day you had the challenge of putting together something different and unusual, and the audience would like it. Okay, this turned into big business. As more people bought FM receivers, then people said, hey, this could be another AM only in stereo. So they bought FM stations, and FM then became AM in stereo. Same freeze-dried formula. Somewhere along the line, the $100 bill stuffed into the sleeve of the 45 RPM record was replaced with the syndrome of the bag of cocaine or a big bag of marijuana, and somebody got the job done. That doesn't happen so much anymore. They're back to cash money. Payola's right there again. And that's the history of uh, rock and roll. When I knew that we were going to be talking, I sat back and I listened to Freak Out. I listened to a lot of the early Zappa and the Mother stuff. Surprisingly, it wears very well. You'd think it would be dated 19 years later, and it's not. Trouble coming every day. Who are the brain police? These tunes wear very well. They're very topical today in, in what's going on out there. Well, yesterday, or was it the day before, was the 20th anniversary of the Watts riots in Los Angeles. And there are people in Watts making speeches on some of the very spots where some of the events in the song uh, were, I described, you know, like the woman getting machine gunned from her seat and all the rest of that stuff. They're on the spot in Watts trying to make people remember what that big race riot was all about. And uh, at the time that that album was recorded, it sold about 40,000 copies, tops, um, and nobody paid any attention to it. But over the years, it has managed to sell volumes and volumes. Unfortunately, the MGM Record Company lost track of all their records. They had a fire, then they had a flood, and they couldn't really tell how many of those things they actually sold. We had to take them to court to find out some of these things, and you know that's the way it goes with record companies. You've had a bad time with record companies I mean, between MGM and Warner Bros. <clears throat> and CBS, who I'm suing now. That first album that, that you had, Freak Out, it cost $21,000 to produce, which right. was an enormous amount of money in those days. That's right. What you about know, the cost of producing record albums? I mean, that $21,000 wouldn't buy you uh, a, a week single. in recording. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Well, in those days, the average rock album cost about uh, six to eight thousand dollars because the average rock album consisted of your hit single plus nine or ten other filler tunes that you recorded as quickly as possible, stuck a glossy photo on the cover with some paisley crap around it, and stamped it out, and there it was. That was a rock album. But Freak Out was done in a different way. It was a concept album, and things had to fit together, and so on and so forth. Even at $21,000, which was a startling budget for that time, the record company resisted spending it because, you know, nobody ever spent that and they didn't want to set a precedent. So when we did our second album, they forced us to a budget which was ten or $11,000 and literally threw us out of the studio at a certain point. You, you know, your vocals aren't done? Okay, too bad. Out. Zip. Like that. And that's one of the reasons why I have my own record company now. Barking Pumpkin Records is your record company. You've got a, uh, a plethora of new of new releases that have come out in the last couple of years mm -hmm. on that label. Let's can we clarify? I stopped counting at mm -hmm. about 42 record albums that you have. Am I, am I close? Yeah, it's around 45 now. Around 45. Yeah. A that's, lot of that's legitimate. Among, and bootlegs are maybe close to 100. Lots of Zappa bootlegs. 
Yeah, lots of red and blue lights. A lot of people who have listened to your music over the years, <coughs> even those of us who have grown up, perhaps think that uh, you know there's a generation gap, which I can see doesn't exist. I saw you on TV one time on a, on a I believe it was a Tom Snyder show. Mm -hmm. You did with Arthur <laughs> Fiedler. <laughs> and here is Zappa and Arthur Fiedler, and I'm seeing a lot of common ground between you guys. Mm, yeah, well, there's something else happened on that show that I'd like to make a comment about. As I walk out there, you know, there's always the warm-up before they actually turn the camera on. You sit down, you meet the host, you sit there, shake hands, okay, hi. I never met Tom Snyder in life. I sit in the chair, they strap on the microphone, the guy starts saying this. Here's a quote. You know, last year, I made two million dollars here in New York. And then he starts scratching his neck, and scratching around like he had the red spiders on him. Okay, that's what he wants to tell me. That's the first words out of his mouth. Okay, I'll accept that. So we do the interview, and he goes, well, Frank, what about these groupies? And, you know, that kind of crap. So a few weeks later, I did an interview with a newspaper in Chicago, and I told the same story. And then a, few, a little while after that, when the newspaper article came out, he opened his show by taking this newspaper and twisting it and throwing it away. I can't help it if he's got red spiders and wants to tell me how much money he makes. Well, Frank, what about these groupies? <laughs> When you, did, when you did Freak Out, the first album that the Mothers of Invention did, it was an interesting album because it was the first concept album. It was the first, if you will, rock opera album. There was a lot of entwining themes going on. I mean, it was the first double album. It was the first double album, especially for a band for their first album. It mm -hmm. was a double album. I mean, there was a lot of history going on. Yeah, well, one of the reasons why that history was possible to be made was the producer that we had for that album was a man named Tom Wilson, who is uh, unfortunately deceased now. But he was the guy who, who made that possible. He took the heat from the record company and uh, was the one who actually spent the $21,000 and let us finish it. With your film 200 Motels, you did some things in that movie that almost we would expect from the Beatles to see. There was a lot of surrealism. You shot the movie on video. You transferred it to film footage. You did things that were almost Beatlesque in 1971. At this point in time, the Beatles were defunct. They weren't even together anymore. Ringo had a cameo performance in the movie. Well, he would have had a more than cameo performance in the movie. Ringo played me. And as far as some of the things that were done, it was the first time they were done. That was the first feature-length motion picture shot on videotape and then transferred to film. The technical effects that were in there are the precursor of maybe 70% of the technical effects that you'll see on MTV or any kind of video channel now. And they were done... Um, with experimental uh, hooking up of mundane equipment that was available at that time. At that time, the video editing itself had to be done manually. They didn't, they didn't even have computers like a CMX to edit the uh, video together. I had to edit that film in video form, standing up in an area that was about as wide from here to there. It was like a trailer, ice cold room a mark with a magic marker on the edge of the tape and then back up 10 seconds from that and then push the button on two machines and then would roll in and hope that it locked okay and every edit in that film was done that way and then it was transferred to 35 millimeter and the soundtrack was synchronized the sweeteners were added sound effects and so forth and it was done and uh, when it first played in Los Angeles, there were technical people from the motion picture industry there at the screening, certainly not because they wanted to see a rock movie, but they were walking up to the screen to see whether they could see any video lines in it. Because the, the company that transferred the film had a device they called a wobulator, which took the scan lines and looped them like this and then sandwiched them on top of each other, which helped to uh, wash out the, the scan. That's why you, 200 Motels has that appearance. But the saddest thing about 200 Motels is the producer of the film, in order to be a really fiscally prudent individual, all of the film was originally shot on two-inch PAL, good quality, you know, better quality than U.S. video, two-inch reels, and there was maybe 25 or 30 of them. He had them bulk erased and resold for scrap, thereby putting three or four thousand dollars back into the film budget in order for him to go to the um, United Artists who had put up the money for the film and say, see, we're really tight with the budget, you know, like maybe next time we'll get a, to do it again. It was so stupid. Do you know what those videotapes would be worth today, the original material? Uncountable fortunes. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that's art. Yeah. And so, you know, somebody saved three or four thousand dollars in order to do that. Everything that, you know, that you've been involved with has been, has been labeled, and I know how much you like labels, but <laughs> art rock and avant-garde and things like that. Your training, uh, what, what kind of training, and in technical training, even with video and, and, and stuff like that as a kid, how did you start out with music? 
Well, first of all, I'm a middle-aged Italian father of four with a high school education. Everything else that I learned, I learned by doing it. You go out and you do it. I learned how to do video editing in one week, the hard way, freezing cold in that room with a magic marker in my hand, you know, with two English editors whose main goal in life was to go across the street to the pub and return to the editing room with tumblers like this full of Guinness, you know, that mm. brown, dangerous liquid, and they were just, you know, okay, that was fun. But, you know, if you have a technically oriented mind and, and you want to learn the discipline of doing that stuff, unless you're the one who has to tweak the machine or replace the resistors in it, you can learn the, the concept of doing these kind of things fairly easily. You know, really, Frank Zappa, it's kind of the story of the all-American self-made man. You're a fundamentalist when it comes to the Constitution. I know you don't like anybody to, to mess with that. You believe in the First Amendment. Uh, we were talking earlier. I want to see somebody who doesn't believe in the First Amendment. I mean, where are these people that, that don't believe? Everybody says they believe in it, but what are you willing to do about it? You know, but well, people want to change it. They want to. They want to rewrite it so it sounds like the 1.2 Amendment. As a writer, you have you've done a lot of writing, and, and of course with your music. As a producer, you produced a lot of people uh, coming out of the Los Angeles underground scene that we're talking about. You, you produced the GTOs, you produced Wild Man Fisher, you I produced, produced the, Captain Beefheart. I produced the first Lowell George single, which never got released. Lowell George was in your band, as a matter of mm -hmm. fact, the Mothers of Invention at one point. And, uh, yep. Lowell Just had a cool. very large following here in Washington with Little Feet. Yeah, there's still a tape someplace in my vault of a song called Lightning Rod Man, and the other, one, the other side was called Black Protruding Tongue, when Lowell had a, a group called The Factory. As a musician, it's not just rock for you. It's like operas like Billy the Mountain and, and projects like that. Did you ever find it difficult, I mean, to go from an instrument like guitar into scoring things that have been uh, played by the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra Chorus, people like that? Well, here's how I got into business. I, at, when I first started off, I was a consumer of rhythm and blues. I never thought I could play it. I liked to listen to it. I used to collect rhythm and blues records. But the, while I was doing that, I was writing chamber music and writing orchestral music. I started writing that when I was 14. I didn't write a rock and roll song until I was in my 20s. And I wrote all this music and uh, sent it to orchestras. Nobody would play it. So I figured if I'm writing music, I better write in a medium where I can get a musician to play it. I remember taking one of my compositions to the guy who was then the conductor of the Baltimore Symphony. His name was Massimo Freccia. And uh, I was so young, you know, he looked at me like, you know, how can you possibly uh, be a, a composer? And was giving me this quiz as we were walking down the street. What's the lowest note on a bassoon? Yeah. Well, be flat. You know, I mean, it's hard to convince somebody if uh, you don't look like you're from a university or something that you can write music. So I just said, and went out and did something else. How when many fingers am I holding up? <laughs> when you left Warner Brothers Records, it seems that you you got more creative when Shake Your Booty came out. It seems that your return to your satire and your, your scope seemed to be, you, you get back to some of that uh, that you had started out with again. It seemed to, to inspire you when you left Warner Brothers Records and you... It would inspire you too if you had been with that company for eight years, I'll tell you. But the real uh, thing that determines the character of each album is who's on it because certain bands have certain types of things that they do well and certain types of things that they do badly and you can't take a band that is specializing in one sort of thing and make them do something else. For example, you couldn't get the band that had Mark and Howard from the Turtles to look or sound like the, the band that had Ruth Underwood and George Duke. It's two different worlds. Well, it's the same idea of the music. You want to have a different medium of expression. So some people like one uh, era of the albums over the others and some people hate them all and that's uh, fine they should be free to do that with 45 albums I think there's something for everybody with, uh, with Frank's epic music well I think so but the problem is getting it out to the public because since today in order to really have exposure on the radio you do have to pay off and I refuse to do it and uh, the other thing that you have to do is play the MTV ball game and uh, you know up to a certain point I'll cooperate with MTV I'll do interviews for them and you know I've been on there before and but it's the whole ethic of selling music via picture where ultimately the picture is the most important thing you're selling you don't listen to the song anymore you're looking at the girl's legs getting out of the car her butt going up and down like that and, you know can you really see her tits through the thing you know that's what that uh, has turned into and it's got nothing to do with the song 
you and after you've watched um, some of those promos, the saturation point comes after maybe six or seven viewings. And um, if you're just listening to a record, you can listen to a record hundreds of times because the appreciation is on a different level. And I'm my feel is music. I like to write music, and that's what I'm interested in. So. Uh, the audience for what I do is probably shriveling up like a prune, but you know, that's tough tuckus. I'm not going to change my tactics uh, in order to, uh, to do something else. If you like it, it's there, and if you don't like it, go do something else. Again, the technology that you're using with your music, you're, you're recording digitally, you're, you're doing mm -hmm. the state-of-the-art recording with Barking Pumpkin Records right now. Yeah, well, if you're going to make a record, why not do it the best way that it's possible to do it? I think that a person who spends the money on the record uh, has worked hard enough for the eight dollars or whatever it is that he's spending on the album, so show him a good time. I've been listening to your music for 20 years and watched it pretty carefully. You are a purveyor of, of the music business. I mean, you know what's, what's going on, what's happening. What do you see happening in the future? What do you see 10 years down the line? Well, it depends on who wins the censorship business that's going on. You know, one way, here I'll give you the bleakest outlook, okay? Let's say that these deranged housewives of Washington, D.C. succeed in prodding the Congress or whatever into enacting legislation that opens the door for the type of censorship that you would have in, in the Soviet Union. You know, Pravda Rock. It has to be state approved and it has to have that kind of aroma that makes it look and smell like something really Christian. And they would do things like this. They would get the foot in the door, and then they would say, this is not enough, we must go directly to the root of the problem. And do you know what the root of the problem is? The root of the problem is the alphabet itself. If certain letters, then certain words could not then be formed. And we would have this new, approved Christian alphabet with about six or seven consonants in it. You wouldn't even be able to spell Jesus Christ with this new alphabet. Then they would go directly to the numbers that we all use when we're adjusting our little bank books and so forth. And they would say, there are four numbers here that are suggested. There's one that looks like a hole, and there's another one that's sticking straight up. They've got to go. And those two that fit together, one that looks like it's upside down against the other one, which we can't say, they've got to go. So now you fix the alphabet and you fix the number system. Now we're going to work on the national bird. Now the eagle is okay, but he's an endangered species. We're going to go for the ostrich. The ostrich represents the way things really are. When the ostrich gets scared, it sticks its head in the ground, it sticks its ass up in the air, and it quakes a little bit, okay? That'll be the new American national bird. Now the flag. The red is too racy, the blue is too deep, and the white is too hard to keep clean. We're going to do away with that, it's going to be beige. It doesn't offend anybody, and it looks great as wallpaper on a Marriott. This is the bleakest outlook. Yeah, and the best is, we'll, we'll say, look, let's be reasonable about this. Sex is good for you. It's a natural function. Uh, there is no reason to think that a person shouldn't know about how his own body works at the, at the earliest possible age. Just because you know about intercourse, masturbation, or any of that, doesn't mean you have to go out and do it when you're five years old, okay? It doesn't hurt to know. Why keep people ignorant? The more you know, the happier you're going to be, all right? So don't be afraid of words that l make you think about sex. You're not going to die from it. You're not going to go to hell from it. You could die from it if you get AIDS. Of course, government's got something to do with that. They've got to spend a little bit more money on it. But, you know, the, the good outlook would be people will say, this, this is unrealistic. It's overblown. It is cotton candy news. And they would just forget it. But that's not going to happen because America has gone too far to the right to just say, okay, I think this is a mistake. While we're on the subject of America, when I was growing up in the 1950s, I grew up in suburban Massachusetts outside of Boston. You could drive a couple of hours one way up into New Hampshire, or you could drive down to New York, and the countryside looked remarkably different when you were in different areas. Things looked different. And now, here we are in the 1980s, with the burger franchises and things like that, everything looks remarkably the same. Well, you know... Is this related to the, the check-writing nincompoops that you refer to? Uh, that it's... I think that it's a reflection of the attitude of the times. People today are in a way mentally more like the people of the 50s because they're so very conformist. They're so afraid of what's going on that they don't want to take the risk of being an individual. Everybody when they go home, they go, oh, am I tired of acting like that? You know, I had to do that to keep my job. Oh, I hate that. Now I'm going to take a bunch of drugs and forget about it. You know, there's a lot of pressure on people because they want to be themselves. 
You were not born as a clone of somebody else. You're an individual, I'm one, you know, you're one. All of you out there, you're one too. So you've got a right to be yourself. But there's all this pressure to act like a certain kind of a person so that you can have certain kinds of friends and fit in somewhere so that you can be certified as a label. You say, oh, I've got it. I like the idea of being a yuppie. So even if you're not one, you know, you'll make yourself one so that you can go to a yuppie bar. And then when yuppies don't want to be called yuppies anymore, you'll turn into whatever they turn into. You gotta have that stuff going for you. I mean, it's a waste of time. What do you think about the way people categorize music nowadays? Is it useful or necessary? Yeah, I guess it is necessary. For whom? For people who don't know anything about music. There are different styles of music, you know, but there's no reason to assume they can't be blended together. Uh, well, how did you get interested in all kind of political and social features about which things you started to make, records and so on? Well, when the mothers first got together, there was no real political music in the United States. <clears throat> I didn't think there was very much elsewhere either. So. Uh, in our first three albums, there was a lot of social commentary. And a lot of people didn't like it because they didn't want to hear that stuff. They would rather hear songs that went baby, baby. So we threw in a few baby babies for them. So you found a quite new field and new audience. Yeah, there was a new audience for it. It wasn't a large audience, but they were interested. What was your relationship to the theater at that time when you began with the mothers? Um, I always thought that it was an interesting medium to explore with a musical group, <coughs> a group that would also act out the uh, events that were supposed to take place in the theater. And we worked in a theater in 1967 for about five months before we came to Europe for the first time. But nowadays you have paid less attention to this theater type of performances. Uh, why did you do that? And well, if I could find a group that had uh, the ideal membership, we'd be able to do both, that is, play complicated music and also do theater. But unfortunately, the music that I've written right now is so complicated that the people who can play it are not very theatrical. <laughs> so, And it's also uh, hard to do fancy stuff on stage when you're playing that many notes. Mm -hmm. And this season, it's mostly a musical band. Well, have you decided to leave those political and socially critical things totally? No, not necessarily. I'd say that the commentary is still there in the music. Mm. What, would, what would be the most interesting topic right at this moment if you would like to make something political again? Well, there are plenty of obvious topics, but uh, that's the problem, you know, that we, when you start thinking about social commentary or political uh, lyrics, um, you can't do anything subtle. You always have to do something really obvious, you know, and then that's no challenge. Mm. When we first started doing that, th nobody else was doing it, you know, and, and after a couple of years, a lot of people started doing it. And uh, I didn't feel that it was necessary for me to do it anymore in an obvious way. How about the new coming of old rock and roll music? What do you think about the commercial? success of that kind of music. Well, we already did that too, but I guess we did it too early. <laughs> but you are not going to do it again? No. How time do you spend usually in preparing maybe a 75-minute show? <laughs> we rehearse. We rehearse all the time. Every day before we play, we rehearse. And before... We, and how long time? One oh. month? Oh yeah, we'll we'll rehearse. Uh, well, before this tour, we rehearse for three weeks, four days a week, five hours a day. Mm. To what extent do your fellow musicians take part in planning and rehearsing the the performance? Well, with this particular band, they just um, do what I tell them mm. because they aren't too uh, theatrically oriented. It was a little bit different with uh, Mark and Howard, you know, because they had already done some funny things on stage, you know, and so they had some ideas, and I would let them do the things that they felt natural doing. 
Have you maybe further plans in making movies? Yeah, I'm working on one right now. What, what kind of a movie is it? May I ask? A monster movie. A monster movie? Mm-hmm. <laughs> And are you maybe going to make experiments with a larger musical works like Lumpy Gravy, for instance? Mm, one day. It's But very expensive. Mm. And it's also very hard to um, get cooperation from large numbers of musicians. Have you ever been invited to the White House? And if you have, <laughs> would you go? I have not been invited. But if I was invited, I would go. You would? Sure I would. Wouldn't you? I would. Wouldn't, wouldn't you go in there just to go, come on. Right. Sure, what a, you, just to walk in there and say, what am I doing here? <laughs> That's the silliest thing I ever heard of. <laughs> okay, thanks so much. Okay. I'm going to throw something at you and see what picture goes through your mind. Jimi Hendrix. Well, Jimi came to our house one time with uh, Buddy Miles. That's when we were living in New York. And uh, they walk in, said hello. Buddy sat on the sofa and immediately passed out and was snoring. And uh, shortly thereafter, Jimmy, who was wearing green velvet pants, demonstrated some sort of intricate dance step and ripped the inside of his pants. And Gail had to sew them back up for him. And then, uh, as they were ready to leave, uh, Jimmy woke up Buddy Miles, and he said goodbye, Frank, and they went out the door. Your thoughts about his music? I had written in articles at that time that I thought what should be done, since he wasn't um, musically literate, he couldn't write it down himself, that he should be put in some sort of... Uh, working relationship with somebody who could write his ideas and have them scored for instruments other than the electric guitar. And I think that would have been something worthwhile to do, but you know, he was too busy <laughs> doing other things to, to ever sit down and take that approach. UFOs. I saw one once. I think they're out there. You know, what, what they are, I don't know. Something's out there? Well, I believe that something is out there. I think that those things that you see in the sky are only one small manifestation of a whole wide range of phenomena that people um, haven't properly named or have attributed um, the wrong source to, to automatically assume that everything is the work of an extraterrestrial intelligence, I think would be a mistake to automatically assume that things that you can't understand are supernatural occurrences, I think that's a mistake. I think that because physics as a science is so imperfect that we may discover eventually that some of the more baffling things that we experience as phenomenon will later be described in very precise terms using tools which we don't have now, which would, but which will be developed later to give more rational explanations for stuff that is too scary. Should we be reaching to connect to other planets, other civilizations, other beings? I think that the idea of space exploration is worthwhile, but I think that to pursue it just because we want to connect with a race of superior beings with this you know, superior intellect who will then come down and bestow wisdom on this particular race is a mistake. Uh, if there is such a species out there, if the if they really were smart, they wouldn't have anything to do with us. Because uh, the only thing that the human species can do perfectly is make a mess out of stuff. I mean, we have, it's so easy for anything that is a human organism to just cause destruction. Because we have this ability to invent destructive things and on a scale that no animal or other organism would be able to do. You know, we can project the worst part of our nature over such vast areas because we have the ability to do that. So I should think that if we ever connected with a superior intelligence someplace, he would probably do the rest of the universe a favor by blotting out all human life on this planet as quickly as possible before we get so skillful that we can spread the bad things that we do to other environments. 
So maybe the best thing is to find these people, you know, because we'll spend a lot of money and we'll go out there and we'll get the superior intelligence and think that he's going to help us out, and he will, just by blowing us up. 1969, Man on the Moon. I watched that. I watched The Man on the Moon on a little screen this big on this cheesy little TV set in my kitchen. You know, and the picture was bad enough if you saw it on a good set, but you can imagine what it looked like on this little thing. But it was still very exciting. I thought it was great that we were able to do it. And uh, it's unfortunate that all the governmental policies that we are reaping today that put this country into an economic state where it is not likely we are going to experience anything, any scientific extravaganza of that magnitude for a long time to come. You know, Man on the Moon cost a lot of money. But it did put a lot of people to work. And it did make the country feel special for a minute. I thought it was a good thing. NASA now is, for the first time, talking about sending civilians, journalists, and others into space, non-astronauts. Japanese, actually, just went up with the Soviets. Could you see yourself in that role? No. Mm, because uh, I don't like being nauseous. And when I think of space flight, the only thing I think of is nausea. I would rather watch it on television. Woodstock. A lot of mud. There was a lot of mud at Woodstock. Uh, we were invited to play there. We turned it down. Um, I thought that it was fabulous that it occurred. I think that it was an important social event in uh, the social history of the United States. It was important. Musically, fully. The Beatles. They were okay. I mean, I was never as big a Beatle fan as a Rolling Stone fan. I thought that the, well, the Rolling Stones were more entertaining for me because of the rhythm and blues uh, basis of what they did. Lenny Bruce. I liked Lenny. He was, uh, we worked a, a concert with him at the Fillmore East in the 60s. We were his opening act. And I remember meeting him in the front of the theater before the show, and I asked him to sign my draft card. And he says, sign it, I won't even touch it. The Peace Corps. I think the Peace Corps is a good idea. Do you ever have any idea of going? No. I'm not the outdoor type. Okay. How about in general, the 60s scene in L.A.? Well, the 60s scene in L.A. was interesting from a sociological standpoint because it took so long for the rest of the world to discover what was going on here. Uh, there had been uh, what was described as a freak scene in Los Angeles uh, established for well over a year before there was any national coverage that something was going on here that was very different than even San Francisco or any place else in the country. It was special. And the driving force behind this particular sociological development was a guy named Vito, who was a painter-sculptor, who was the, let's call him the um, boss of, let's call it a cult, of people who were just weird and liked to be weird and would dress weird, and every night they would go out and they would dance weird. and people looked at it and said, well, that's pretty weird. I think I'll do that, too. And it just kept growing and growing. Vito was in his 60s then. And he was out just flailing all over the place every night. And uh, I came in from Cucamonga, which is where I was living before I moved to, to Hollywood, and saw this and went, whoa, this is definitely quite unique. And uh, I watched it develop, and I watched all these different strange hairstyles and clothing styles and all this stuff happen, and I saw more and more people doing it, and I saw them gathering at Ben Frank's and at Canner's and the Whiskey A Go-Go and the trip, and they were walking up and down Sunset Strip, and it was quite a highly developed thing, like a circus every night. Finally, a year and a half later, 
it was either Time or Newsweek did a an article on unisex hairdos and had a photograph of a guy that we knew as uh, Beetle Bob, eventually to become come known as Buffalo Bob, who had a kind of Prince Valiant haircut and wore velvet jackets, and they had a photograph of him, and it was like this shocking thing that a man had hair that looked sort of unisex. And that's, you know, the first time that I know of that there was any national coverage, that there was anything going on in Hollywood. And eventually the real estate developers of Hollywood put an end to it. They complained to the police that these people with these strange hairdos and clothes were reducing their property value along Sunset Boulevard. Something had to be done about it because they were walking up and down the street. And uh, so they started to have these roundups. The sheriff's department would come to Hollywood nightly with these buses for carrying prisoners and without any kind of due process just round people up, total harassment, herd them onto these buses, take them downtown and release them. It was just, you know, to harass you to keep you from going to uh, the, the Sunset Strip. And eventually, that was fairly successful. It, it put this, a little fear into the people there. There were some tense moments with that policy. But the real way they killed the scene in Hollywood was to talk to the club owners and threaten them to make them stop hiring those kinds of bands which attracted that kind of clientele. And by that time, they had virtually destroyed what whatever scene was developing in Hollywood, and that's when we moved to New York. Talking about unisex nonconformists, one of the heroes of the century, way ahead, way before the 60s, had had that look. Your comments, Albert Einstein. He had good hair, you know. And um, the thing that I like about Albert Einstein, I, I hope it's not an apocryphal story, but. Uh, he liked the television show that I liked, which was Time for Beanie. I heard the story that he uh, left a, an important meeting at one time telling the people that it was he had to go watch Time for Beanie. And I hope that's true. Well, we know for a fact that he also loved the character and connected with Sid Caesar to tell him. That, actually, Oppenheimer told Sid Caesar that Einstein loved the professor. <laughs> Do you remember the character? No. You remember Sid Caesar's professor? No. That's a fact. So no. Einstein did like television. So maybe it's not apocryphal. Well, I wonder whether he watched wrestling then. I wonder. Well, 1964, if you would talk a little bit about the mothers. What do you want me to say? I don't know. How did <clears> it happen? <throat> I got a phone call from a guy that I had done some recording with in the past named uh, Ray Collins. He was working with a bar band at a club in Pomona called the Broadside, and uh, he had had a fist fight with their guitar player, and uh, they needed a substitute guitar player for a job on the weekend. And so I was the substitute, and I went down there and played. It was basically dance music, Louie Louie and Midnight Hour and all that kind of stuff. And I kind of liked the band <coughs> and suggested that... Um, if we were to learn some original material that it would be possible, theoretically possible, to make a record. And the guy who was the leader of the band was a sax player named Davey Coronado. And he says, no, don't do that, because if you play original material, you can't work these jobs in these bars anymore. I mean, that was the fact. Because um, musicians in this area that they referred to as the Inland Empire were used only as jukebox function to keep, make people drink this bad beer that they serve there. And if you played a song that people did not recognize, the chances went up that they wouldn't dance to it. And if they didn't dance, they wouldn't drink. And if they didn't drink, then the bartender would, or the owner would fire you. So all the bands were um, induced to be as derivative as possible. And the more songs you played that sounded like what was on the radio, the better band you were. So anybody who took the chance to learn and perform original material really was taking a big risk. And uh, it turned out that Davy Coronado was right. The minute we started playing original material, we got fired from every place that we tried to work. And only got a record contract uh, by accident, because we had been turned down by all the different companies. And um, the man from MGM who signed us 
was busy someplace else the night that he was supposed to come and see our group. He was he had some girl sitting in his lap at a club down the street, and our manager kind of dragged him by the ear down to the Whiskey A Go Go where we were playing and you know said just listen just for a moment. So that's all he did. He listened for a moment. He said okay, we'll give him twenty five hundred dollars and we'll sign him. And uh, you know he didn't he had no idea what we really did because he walked in while we were playing a boogie, <laughs> and left before we did anything weird. So you can imagine how shocked he was when uh, uh, I think the first tune that we recorded when we made the Freak Out album was Any Way the Wind Blows or Something Easy. But the second tune was Who Are the Brain Police? And MGM was a New York-based company, and he had, he had to commute back and forth from Hollywood to New York to, in order to sign and record these West Coast groups, and I saw him climb on the phone through the window in the control room. As soon as we got into this thing, he, it's like he was calling the head off to office to say, well, I don't know what it is, but they're doing it out there. Did you invent the name Mothers of Invention? Yeah. Just like that? Yeah. Maybe, just, if people are interested, maybe you could use it in the phrase. Well, the... Uh, the band was called The Mothers, and uh, the record company said, well, after we had already made the album and it was about to be released, they came to the conclusion that they couldn't really release a record by anyone called The Mothers because disc jockeys wouldn't play it, because they wouldn't say the, the name of the band on the air, I mean, which I thought was absurd. And they were going to cancel our contract, so out of necessity we became The Mothers of Invention. Poof. Well, Mr. Zappa, the remarkable thing is that uh, the East Block leaders seem to find in you a source of inspiration instead of that you are considered like a pariah. Well, I've never been that uh, well received by the political people in the United States because I disagree with most of them. And uh, I think I have a right to disagree with them. At least it says so in the Constitution here. And I ought to disagree with them because they're, for the most part, stupid, uh, banal, greedy, little incompetence and shouldn't be in government at all. So I don't like them, but that's our government. But it's not, not an explanation for the fact why you are so well received in these block countries. Uh, I think that one of the reasons why they like me over there is because they've been listening to the records for a long time, which is not true in the United States because they don't play my music here. Beer, as you might know, is very important to the Dutch. And what are you saying? You say beer leads to pseudo-military behavior. Well, I, my theory is that winos don't march. And, uh, I mean, the, the statistics show <laughs> winos don't march. And in the United States, the consumption of beer is tied to uh, uh, situations wherein males engage in aggressive acts in groups, lubricated by this beverage. And uh, I don't know whether there is a um, chemical reason why the formula for beer produces these kinds of psychological results in groups of males, or whether it's just the way in which beer is merchandised here, because I think beer is consumed in the United States in a, uh, differently than it's consumed in Europe. In Europe, it's just a, it's a food stuff, and it, you know, you drink beer. Here, Drinking beer is a special social activity because it's been, the concept of it has been uh, described for you in music and pictures, uh, in, in commercials year after year. And you see a certain lifestyle manifested uh, for the, how you are supposed to behave when you drink beer. How is that? Well, you have to... Uh, um, enjoy sports, you have to hang out with uh, members of your own sex and slap them on the back while you're drinking it, usually on Friday night in crowded places that are sort of dimly lit. And when you drink the right kind of beer, you are rewarded by the presence of a girl with a large chest who will like you better because you drank a certain brand of beer, and you're a more exciting person because you drink beer, and you're more rugged, and these are all the things that m should make you want to drink beer. And I think that Besides the, the psychological wrapper that's been put around the idea of consuming beer, there's a strong possibility that the formula of beer induces yeast growth in the body, and the yeast can have some effect on the way your brain works. It's just like those beer commercials. Expectations like what? 
Well, that a perfect girl will love you because you are such a wonderful person. First of all, you're not a wonderful person. Secondly, there are no perfect girls. And thirdly, you're not going to get together. Yes. And uh, then, of course, if you do, you will break up, and then it will be very sad, and there will be a song about that, and that song will tell you how to behave when you break up. And then, since there is no real sex education in this country... Um, you have Ruth Westheimer, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, Dr. Ruth. <clears throat> well, she's, I don't think she's on anymore. Her task is over? <laughs> Everyone knows what to do now. Well, basically, I think her answer to everything was just jerk off and it'll be fine. <clears throat> But, um, you know, I could have told you that. But you weren't asked to do it. No. Yeah. For you, it's, so it's you can take that from Dr. Ruth because she's a doctor, she's a Ruth, and she has, you know, a heavy accent, which makes her sound, uh, you know, like she knows Reliable. what she's talking about. Yeah, so I mean, if you just turn to somebody and say, you got a problem, go jerk off then that doesn't always convince people that you have the answer. But if you say it... It although, sounds quite reliable. Well, I think it's practical, but, you know, you can't build a television series out of that. A, a red thread in this book is that you often say that you haven't been treated seriously enough by the Americans. We always have the impression that by the Europeans you've been treated very seriously. I don't know whether that's true. First of all, I don't think it is important to be treated seriously. I think seriousness itself is something that's to be laughed at but at the same time the way in which what I do is um, observed and consumed in the United States is totally out of proportion to what I actually do and what do you do actually thanks very much Good evening. If uh, there is such a thing as uh, an electric underground, a counterculture of decibels, our guest tonight amplifies all that is most in it. Frank Zappa is in Australia from the United States to give a series of concerts with his group, the Mothers of Invention. Well, here are some of the things that people have written about Frank Zappa. To many people, Zappa has often seemed to be a force of cultural darkness, a Mephistophelian figure serving as a lone, brutal reminder of music's potential for invoking chaos and destruction. That's from Time in October 1969. <laughs> and from the Australian magazine Go Set this year, <laughs> the greatest satirist of all time, the distorted mirror through which we experience ourselves and the neurotic perverted society that man has created. <laughs> from the book Rock from the Beginning, by any standard he was quite outstandingly ugly. <laughs> But the mothers, his group, left him looking like Robert Goulet. Bearded and gross and filthy, entirely obscene, they were the classic New Yorker cartoon of beatniks brought to life. And finally, I was never a hippie, always a freak, but never a hippie. Frank Zappa on Frank Zappa. Well, what does it all add up to? What is Frank Zappa about? And what is the rock music counterculture all about? Does it have a political message? Is it revolution? Or is it just fun, inspiration, and a lot of money? Frank Zappa is about music, and that part can't easily be put into words. But here's a taste from the titles of some of his records. Freak Out, We're Only In It For The Money, Burnt Weenie Sandwich, Uncle Meat, Hot Rats. Well, it's hardly Tin Pan Alley, but just what is it really? Frank, uh, during the past few days, I've been reading some of the things that you've said about the rock scene, and uh, you've said quite a lot seems to be. In one article uh, in Life magazine in June 1968, um, I thought perhaps was the best indication of, of what your thinking is. One of the things you said there is this, rock is a necessary element of contemporary society. And you said there, not that rock is just enjoyable or fun, but it's necessary. What do you mean by necessary? I think that it's a necessary outlet for the type of energy that people in the adolescent age range have to... Hello. <coughs> little feedback there. Uh, you have to have some release for that energy as you're growing up. You said more than that. You said it has all the answers to what your mother and father won't tell you. You seem to be talking no, about the generation. I was, talking, I was talking specifically about certain lyrics that happened in certain songs between the 50s and the 60s. Mm -hmm. And that's no longer true? Well, there are some things, well, for one thing, some mothers and fathers today are saying some things that you might want to listen to. There's always that small 
category, but there are still songs where you can pick up information that you wouldn't normally get in school. You also said to deny rock music its place in the society was to deny sexuality. You're saying that rock is predominantly about youth and sexuality. Well, you're taking those quotes a little bit out of context because they were talking mainly about the function of rhythm and blues lyrics during the 50s. And that was a much more sexually inhibited time and certain rhythm and blues records had explicit lyrics. And it was the only pop music form where you could hear things that talked about body functions in a specific way. And, uh, you know, even though they talked around it sometimes, but you knew what the, the information was all about. And when they weren't offering sex education in high schools, and when you couldn't uh, have access easily to information that would explain some phenomenons that you might be experiencing in your own body, you could get that information from records sometimes. But all that's in the past, you're saying? Well, it's not so necessary anymore because the sexual standards in the United States have changed to the point where uh, gratification is easier to obtain and there's more widespread information about the uses of those organs that provide the gratification, so you don't need to find that out so much from a record. And uh, consequently, the information that's being transmitted in the lyrics of most of the records now deals with the phenomenon that you experience if you're using drugs. So that's what the, one of the changes that I've seen in the lyrics. Do you ascribe any political revolutionary implications to rock? Um, and that's using a fairly narrow definition of politics. Well, tell me what your narrow definition well, is. Well, I'm cutting out drugs and sex. Uh, well, what are you including? <laughs> <laughs> Why I ask it is it seems to me that to ascribe any political significance to rock is to fall victim to a sort of Hollywood mentality that suggests that there can't even be political change without musical accompaniment. Oh, no, that's not true. I think that rock, um, in some ways, describes the, uh, the mood of, of that mass of the population that listens to the music and that selects the music that identifies with most as being the most popular. And so by judging which records are the most popular, you can gain some kind of marketing concept of what the, the mentality is of the audience. Right, so it's an so indicator. what does the scene look like now when you've got groups like the Osmonds, the Jackson Five, um, dishing up this sort of trite stuff at the moment. But see, there's always been groups like the Osmonds and the Jackson Five and the Beatles and everybody else all down the line uh, within the, the framework of formula radio. But they're getting younger. Where would it all end? What, the, uh, the groups or the audience for the groups? The groups, I guess the audiences too, since they're traditionally a couple of years younger. Well... When you have a situation where radio is controlled strictly on the basis of how much money the sponsors can make from buying time on the air, and the station has to present ratings to the sponsor, which show that they have the largest audience, and when they do research and find out that the most, the thing that people want to hear most is the Osmond Brothers and whatever else, uh, that shows you something about the mentality of, of the audience. I think it shows you their age, though. Yes, yeah. but there are, there are stations that cater to various age groups in the United States. I don't know what your radio scene is here, but in the United States they have rock stations, they have FM jazz type stations, they have classical stations, they have middle of the road stations, and each one caters to a particular audience. And if you study the programming on each one of those types of stations, it'll give you information about the mentality of the people who ascribe to it. Frank, you were saying before that you saw part of, you know, part of what you were trying to do as being able to play the sort of music for mass audiences that the old jazz blues musos used to play for much smaller ones mm -hmm. or the same sort of experimental stuff. Um, do you feel at all that there's a sort of block in the way society conditions people to hear music that means that you're in fact always going to have to have a very minority audience that can overcome that block? Well, the only way that we're really going to be able to reach a large audience is by giving that large audience a chance to hear what we do. In the, in the United States, we don't get our records played on the air very much, and I think in Australia, the number of times that any of our works get played on the air here is so minuscule, you might as well not even mention it. So that's our, the first stumbling blo block to reaching a large audience, is just letting them hear what we do, rather than hear about it by word of mouth. Yeah, but and the, the only other thing you can do is play it for them in a concert situation. But the normal, you know, the, the sort of straight and teeny bopper type reaction to Frank Zappa is, that's not music, that's just sort of loud noises. You know, and it seems that the society has built into people, you know, a, they've learnt how to listen to music, right? And it seems as though you've got to take almost a consciousness leap to get to the point where Zappa really means something to you. Well, all I can say is, 
I play the kind of music I like to play. It, it amuses me to stand up there and do what I do. It feels good to play guitar. I like to do what I'm doing. If there's somebody else that likes doing it, I'm pleased to do it for them. And the more people that I can do it for, the happier I'll be. But if they don't like it, there are plenty of other types of music that are being presented for the same purpose, to get them off in an entertainment type way. So. Sure, but as a musician, you've been coming out with albums like Freak Out, which is another side of you. Um, which seems to be sending up the whole system as such. Well, you have to consider that <clears throat> a lot of people think that there's serious music, yeah. and there's comedy music, and then there's cowboy music, and there's other kind of music and like that. And I think there's music, and there's physical activity, and there's concepts, and there's sociology, and it goes <laughs> on and on. And when I compose a piece, all those things are involved in, in the same thing. Uh, you have to consider that any piece of music that's written on paper or prescribed, you know, a set piece, is going to sound different each time a gr different group of musicians play it. And so as I construct things for the musicians that I'm working with, I take their personalities into consideration and build that into the music. You said that you are using the techniques of Madison Avenue to change the whole country around painlessly. Um, that was in 1968. Are you, oh, is this campaign still going? I never said that. Oh, if you if you're point. relying on quotes extracted from interviews, you're in trouble. I've written two pieces for publication, one in Life, one in the um, uh, Hi-Fi and Stereo Review, a piece about Edgar Varese. Most of the rest of the interviews that I've done over the past seven or eight years have been pretty badly misquoted or badly transcribed from tapes, and so sometimes things that get perpetuated, like for instance, there was one thing that was in a Rolling Stone interview yeah. where a guy spent five hours with me interviewing me and wound up taking an article. Uh, he took other people's articles and took chunks out of it from other papers and stuck it in there and combined it with a bio that was passed out for tours by the, by the office. So, you know, well, 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 then, tell me what I was supposed to say again. Oh, uh, you were supposed to have said, um, I want to use the techniques of Madison Avenue to change the whole country around painlessly. I don't talk that way. Oh. Well, um, well then, <laughs> I'll tell you, my experience in advertising is this. I used to do national advertising for a greeting card company in California, and I was also a freelance commercial artist, and I did some ads for the First National Bank of Ontario, California, and I never worked in Madison Avenue, and I was never employed by an advertising agency, and the advertising that I'm talking about is things on a small scale like that that I've personally experienced. However, I am aware of the psychological techniques that can be used by advertising agencies. I'm interested in the subject of semantics, mm -hmm. and uh, I will use those tools to express my point. Well, well um, when you first started, um, your group had the reputation of being rude to audiences. Um, you would come out and say, hello, pigs. Um, you don't insult audiences anymore, overtly. Um, not even, not even psychologically. Perhaps you're, you're trying to put across a serious brand of music. Um, why? How did the change come about? Well, <clears throat> I have said to audiences, "Hello, pigs," and I'll tell you exactly the circumstances under which I might say that to an audience. We we did something that uh, probably no other rock group has ever done. We worked in New York in a 300 capacity theater for five or six months in 1967. We did two shows a night, six nights a week. The show consisted of a stage, our equipment, a box of toys, and the audience. And the audience was oftentimes involved in what we were doing. The audience that came to see us was basically a tourist type audience or kids from the outskirts of uh, the city who would come into town to get drunk, to get wasted, to get laid, to get whatever, and we were like a, a circus peep show on uh, this particular street in Greenwich Village. And so they would come in there and they would behave like pigs and I would say, hello pigs. And you know what they would do? They would love it. They loved every minute of it. And there were regular people that would come back night after night to see the shows. And uh, one of these, to give you an idea of the type of audience, the characters that would come in, this one kid, I think he saw about 30 of the shows and saved all the ticket stubs. And after we finished our run there, he came and showed me his whole stash of stubs. But he used to come in, and uh, he always wanted to get up onto the stage. And what he wanted to do was come up and grab the microphone while I was 
singing and grab it and scream at the top of his lungs and then collapse on the stage. And then he wanted me to spit Coca-Cola all over him. <laughs> and so I said, sure. Come on, do it. You know? He did it three or four times. You know, he came in, every time I saw him in the audience, I go, <laughs> it sounds almost like a sexual perversion. Yeah, the music you're playing on this Australian tour isn't what some people would call rock and roll or rock. Uh, are you broadening the scope of your music to, to try and embrace other uh, cultural groupings? You mean, am I playing things that are not rock and roll in order to attract an audience that is not a rock and roll audience? Yeah, basically. No, I'm playing the music that I'm playing for whoever happens to show up to hear it. And they can be any age, any color, any size, any shape, any sex, anything they want to be. You know, yeah, so but I'm you were promoted as a freak on the posters, and maybe you're not responsible for I didn't, I didn't for draw the poster. <laughs> yeah, but you know, you're part of the game. You come out here as a performer. Yeah. You've got a, a promotions man, you've got a big record company which is distributing your records. You're part yeah. of the system. Well, not exactly. No, what you're trying to tell me is that I set these people up by saying that I was a freak and come see this freak and then I stand there and be normal? <laughs> yeah. No, that's not true at all. First of all, I had no, nothing whatsoever to do with any Australian promotion. All I did was get off an airplane, go through customs, check into a hotel and start playing concerts. All right, well, you're just, you, then it appears that you're just a musician, right? <coughs> That you don't care what the system's yeah, doing to you. No, I do care. You know, but what am I supposed to do? Go out and personally tear down every poster that looks like that over there? But so, Frank, how would you set about explaining the values of the drug culture to people who have a pathological fear of, of the use of narcotics? Well... I'm not part of the drug culture because I don't take drugs, but I can identify with some of the reasons why people are, are forced uh, to live their lives that way. And they're just under, under pressure. They feel they're misunderstood in one way or another, and they look for a physical gratification from things that, from chemical substances that uh, change the way their bodies feel and, and change their attitudes for certain periods of time. They give them escape. What is it that seeks them to need this physical gratification? Or well, if, if, they, if they felt comfortable in their environment the way it was, you know, in real life, then they probably wouldn't need the escape. It's the same thing with people who drink to an excess, who need to relieve the tension of their existence. You know, it's just a different chemical combination, that's all. And yet, you know, it seems that the sorts of changes that are taking place in the, the American drug scene, you know, as more and more hard dope starts hitting people, um, seems to be reflected in a hell of a lot of of rock music, it seems to be getting harsher, uh, you know, so, and, and more broken up, um, well, as you know, more complex, possibly. It, well, I don't know about that, but uh, I think that as a drug goes on the charts, so to speak, as cocaine becomes more popular in the United States, certain groups who know the commercial value of speaking of trends will write songs that deal with the subject of cocaine and they'll sell some records because other people who are using cocaine will identify with that thing as being part of their experience. And See? people who want to be cool and That's appear, right. yeah, right. Yeah. So I've, I've been so. struck by the number of Jesus freaks who seem to be cured drug addicts. Do you see this as any sort of logical progression? The most horrible thing about that is I read something the other day where um, there was some evidence uncovered in England <clears throat> that showed a connection between the CIA setting up the Jesus Freaks and one of these other uh, uh, religious movements. So I don't know how to perceive the connection between the cured drug addicts because I've also heard about the CIA dispensing heroin in the United States. So, Do you see this as one addiction replacing another? I see it as something pretty strange. I don't... Yeah, you could look at it as an addiction, replacing an addiction. Yeah, but is the, the relationship, say, of the Jesus freaks to their God any different to the relationship of, say, groupies to you? Well, I knew somebody would wind up sticking groupies in their sides, right. but... Uh, you wrote a lot about them in your Life article in 1968. Well, I think that it was about time that somebody did start discussing groupies because prior to that time it was a, a sociological phenomenon that had existed uh, in the, the pop world. It's been existing for years and years and nobody even said anything about it. And, and uh, I was the first one to put it in print. Well, can I just quote what you did say? You said, they make the ultimate gesture of worship, human sacrifice. Even <laughs> 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 program of ill repute but in this regard like Monday conference so it wouldn't be as male sexist as that. Well, Just not, your worship, human sacrifice? But that is exactly what happens. That's all yeah. right. So all you have to do is describe what's happening. I'm describing a phenomenon. Why should you call it sexist?
You said it's also, it's one of the most amazingly beautiful products of the sexual revolution. Why beautiful? Well, you'd have to go on the road and check it out a few times. <laughs> but, ser you know, what's the serious answer to it? That's the serious answer to it. You can't, you can't really discuss groupies from an armchair position unless you go out there and have uh, some experience with groupies from a performer to groupie relationship. So, um, yeah, but they're the only values that matter, the relationship between the performer and the groupie. No, I didn't say I mean, that at all. Well, <laughs> you seem to be saying that. I mean, you know, what about members of society who are neither performers nor groupies? Are they allowed to have a view about it? Well, first of all, you have to consider that every profession has its equivalent of a groupie. There are girls who are attracted to people who work in every profession. Mm -hmm. And so, it just so happens that pop music has a name for them, groupies. It but also there are has girls more of them. Hmm? also has more of them. Well, yes. You said earlier that you felt that in the 50s and 60s that the younger audiences were more sexually inhibited. Do you feel that with this less sexually inhibited audience that you're providing some kind of a service to your groupies? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, in some ways, sure. But I think that uh, we're a very bad choice of groups to be discussing uh, groupies about because the incidence of swooning girls associated with the Mothers of Invention by virtue of the, the type of program that we play and the, uh, the type of you know, thing that we do, we don't attract groupies in the style, number, or uh, attitude that most normal pop groups do. You know, we don't have screaming teenage girls out there. Our audience, actually, from statistics, is basically male between the ages of 15 and 18 from a, a middle-class background. Do you feel that... The whole group is seen as, as... There are parts of it very, that are very sophisticated. There was an exhibition last year in New York of two groupies who are of plaster casts of their trophies, um, so-called. Um, do you consider that the groupies can be an art form? Well, I like people, you know, and I take them for what they are. I think that there are some groupies who are interesting, and there are other groupies who are really boring, and there are other groupies who are fun, and there are groupies who are this and that, and they're just... The reason you classify them as groupies is, is because they present themselves in a groupie situation. In other words, boop, there they are in a dressing room, for instance. There, there's actually a lot of, lot of rock groups um, who play serious groupies anymore. Um, they have friends, um, and... The groupie syndrome seems to be centered around people like David Cassidy, the Osmonds, the Jackson Five. Mm -hmm. um, the, the less sophisticated audiences do the less sophisticated things for their rock groups. Well, the, the term groupie only comes up when somebody's doing an interview like this and they extract it out of a thing, you know, because for the public at large, it's a mysterious uh, sort of sexually titillating Issue that's that's incredible, on the side. isn't it? Because the, the name itself has been around for something like five years. Yeah, at yeah. least that. Well, you know, you do have friends. You meet nice people when you go out on the road. Mm. And a lot of them happen to be girls. Is there anyone in the audience now who'd like to raise anything? That... No? Too late? <laughs> right. Um, it's a big chance. Make it quick, please. <laughs> 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 you know, just make them up. control of your output now. What? You obviously have complete control of your artistic output at the moment on record. Um, could I ask you to what extent you think um, somebody at the beginning should compromise their art, such as it is, you know, uh, for the sake of getting public recognition? As little as possible. Um, I, I wanted to ask you whether you were misquoted the other day by, <coughs> excuse me, one of the few underground uh, papers in Australia, Digger, and I'm not connected with it, uh, when you said that you were, you were worried, or words to this effect, you were worried about not having made a cent out of the Zappa poster, poster so showing you on a toilet seat. No, I um, didn't say I was worried. I just mentioned that in passing because uh, they were asking about the origins of the poster and I went through the process of explaining the copyright laws and so forth. And that's to inform people that I did not sit on a toilet in the hopes of selling millions of posters worldwide to earn my living from that. I play music. And unfortunately, more people know I think, my face. I think it must have been a misquote again, because it certainly uh, emphasised the fact that, that, you know, what seemed to worry you was the fact that you weren't getting any money out of it. And why I brought that up was because it seems to me that, that you're in a false position here and that uh, a lot of us are in a 
are in a false position here tonight because you're being um, sort of foisted upon a middle class audience as a revolutionary. You're not. Uh, neither well, that's are been we. on the head, that's for sure. <coughs> I, well, I think so, Bob. But I, I think your, your questions have, uh, have only accentuated the sort of middle class prejudices that people have about the rock scene. Mm -hmm. um, no, using that look, slide from what I was it. doing, I was asking the questions that people really ask. Not dummy <coughs> questions, but dinkum questions. No, they're not dinkum questions. You may not like them, but they're How real. How do you know they're, they're dinkum questions? Now, ask the we, audience. Okay, and if we've answered, if Frank Zappa has answered to the best of his ability, some, that's good. That's a net gain, isn't it? But he's an individual. You're putting him up as, uh, as a rock idol, you know. Look, everyone's an individual. Everyone's special. Everyone's if, a if rock we, idol? And, no, no, no. If we, if we worked on that basis, we would never have anybody on Monday conference. <laughs> everyone's special. Not only rock stars, everyone's special. But don't make people what they're not, you know. Anyone else have it? Yes. Um, do you approve of... Um, uh, there's a lot of musicians coming out these days who make a great thing of their musical virtuosity, especially in guitars, people like John McLaughlin, who I think is most famous for his just ability to move his fingers fast. Mm -hmm. Do you approve of that or do you prefer in guitarists? Uh, just the taste, taste we're playing. Well, I'm impressed by both. You know, anybody who can move his fingers that fast is certainly entitled to some credit. Yeah. You know, <laughs> but uh, I would rather listen to somebody who surprises me because the ability to play scales up and down an instrument, whatever that instrument is, fast you can go, is something that you can practice forever and ever and just develop manual skill. But in order to play something that just surprises you out of your chair, now that's a little bit harder to do. Who you surprises you? Hmm? Who surprises you? Not too many people. One, one of the points about John McLaughlin is, is uh, uh, his religious thing, though. I'm sorry, I'm Make it short, though. Yes. Um, it's the, he's using music to... Uh, convey his, his religious beliefs. Um, is this a valid use of rock and roll? I, I think it is, if it's his own personal taste. I, I use the music that I convey uh, to play to convey my own personal convictions about the way I live, because it's all derived from my personal experiences. So, I guess it's fair. Do you ever see yourself coming back to something quite so verbally oriented as the Fillmore album? Oh yeah, it's always possible. I just do whatever I feel like at the time. The next album that we're putting out is, um, it's all vocals except for two songs. Why did that album happen just at that particular time? Which, the Fillmore album? Yeah. It happened because there we were on stage at the Fillmore and we played it. And I thought it was good and we put it out right away. <laughs> Anyone else from the panel? Yeah. yeah, I was going to ask you a question. What if you thought of um, groups like uh, Alice Cooper, who, um, you know, they've kind of got very famous now, and they started off doing a lot of very um, sadistic acts, like killing chickens, things like that on stage. Do you think that um, the audience has come along to um, see them kind of... Well, there's one act where uh, Alice Cooper cut his head off. At least they thought it was Alice Cooper's head that was decapitated, but <laughs> fortunately it wasn't. Uh, do you think the audience has come along to see a show, to be entertained, or um, they come along for an outlet for their aggression because they're frightened by the kind of increasing level of violence in society. Both. Definitely both. Mm. And the you fact that, that they are entertained by that is pretty unfortunate. Mm. Do you feel that the um, popularity of hard rock music with young girls is a result of the fact that their aggressiveness, particularly their sexual aggressiveness, has been suppressed in society? Yes. Thank you. Uh, do you think that... <laughs> Uh, rock is going to become so complicated as your music is very complex now that it's going to lose its audience? No, I don't think that there are too many groups that are going to go in the direction that we go in because they can't really, you know, it's easier for them to stomp it out because I think more people statistically would rather hear it stomped out. And so it's not very tempting to put together something complicated when it's more fun to stomp it out. Well, do you think the people going back to the primitive thing are also going to lose their audience because of the increasing sophistication of some of the band? There will always be an audience for stomping it out music. The um, United States Supreme Court, as you probably know, has reversed its old ruling on the test for obscenity and made it much stricter. I mean, it's now a less liberal uh, mm -hmm. definition. Is this going to affect your work in any way? Yes, it will. In, w in what ways? Well, the problem in the United States is you have a lot of states where you don't have so many here. And each area is uh, left to determine its own uh, values as to what is pornographic or obscene or actionable by a court and so on and so forth. And in each one of those areas, you have people who are out to make a reputation for themselves as upholders of justice and protectors of the whatever. And so as you ship a, a piece of merchandise across a state line, 
uh, one state, the social uh, attitudes towards certain uh, words or descriptive pictures or whatever. Uh, in one state it might be okay, in another state it might be not okay, and so consequently you're going to wind up with sprinkled lawsuits all over the country, and uh, I think it's really a step backward. Frank, thank you very much. I'm sorry, that is the time. Thank you very much for joining us on Monday conference. All right. Uh, thanks for... I should say that Frank has flown up from Melbourne especially to be with us, to confront his middle-class audience of one. Uh, we do appreciate that uh, very much that he's given us the... <laughs> This morning we go to the Hollywood Hills and the home of a man who once said, I never set out to be weird, it was always other people who called me weird. A man who was the embodiment of the 60s, dubbed the Rasputin of rock and roll. This morning we are at home with Frank Zappa. Frank Vincent Zappa, the oldest of four children, was born 48 years ago in Baltimore, Maryland to Francis and Rose Marie Zappa, who were of Sicilian, Greek, Arab and French descent. Frank was a sick young boy, and so the Zappas went west in search of a healthier climate and settled in Lancaster, California, where Frank formed his first band, the Blackouts. By 1966, the Mothers of Invention was born. The band set out on an uncharted musical course. In 1967, he married Gail Slotman. They're still married. They have four children, Moon Unit, Dweezil, Amit, and Diva. Zappa's musical history includes more than 50 LPs running the gamut from The Grand Wazoo and Lumpy Gravy to Jazz from Hell, which won a Grammy in 1987, to his own classically oriented compositions, which he recorded with the London Symphony. In court, testifying against censorship of rock lyrics, Zappa is, an out, as, is as outspoken as he is on stage. After four years away from the stage, Zappa completed a world tour in 1988 for his newest release, Broadway the Hard Way. And just out is the real Frank Zappa book for the benefit of those who might have misunderstood the Zappa mind. And right now, Frank Zappa, mind and body, is in his home in the Hollywood Hills, where we join him this morning. Morning, Frank. <coughs> morning. We are checking with our At Home With archivist, and we think this may in fact be the first time we've had an At Home With segment with a person in a bathrobe, so... Uh, really? Yeah. You know what time it is here? <laughs> you want to see me in a suit and tie at this hour of the morning? <laughs> what, what part of your house are we in right now? We're sitting in the basement. And uh, is, this, is this... somebody has suggested this is your video room? Well, there's video equipment in here. I review tapes in here. There's a bunch of videotapes around the room. And um, usually I do all the interviews in this room. Yeah. What, what do you watch? Do you watch TV ever? Sure. I like to watch the news and I like to watch C-SPAN. C-SPAN? Yeah. Uh, do you watch MTV or VH1 or any of that sort of stuff? Well, I've occasionally seen it, but I usually try and whiz by those channels. Uh, you are a grazer then, I take it. Uh, actually, I'm a, a pole vaulter when it comes to those ones. <laughs> I need to ask you a little bit about some of the stuff that's in the room. Behind you, there are some license plates, which I guess is an ironic thing to have up on the wall in that I don't think... When was the last time you had a, a regular driver's license? 1967. I don't drive. You don't? These, dr are, these are gifts that uh, fans have sent to me, and this is only a few of them. You know, I'm, I'm a little bit lax in putting the stuff up on the wall. Why did you write uh, this book? Because Ann Patty said it would be really easy. <laughs> was it? No. And so, what what was it like to do it then? Uh, well, the the part you see, when she told me it was going to be easy, Peter Rocchio Grosso was going to do these interviews, and you know, I just talk into a tape recorder, and then he was going to go away, and I would have a book. But after the uh, tapes were transcribed and I saw the way it looked, it just didn't sound like me on paper. So I went into a little room with a word processor and three months later I had rewritten the book. Is this, is this sort of the truth about Frank Zappa? I mean, is this as kind of an attempt to demythologize? Huh? Take the myth out of yourself? <laughs> Taking the myth out of myself. No. I've tried to take the myth out of myself uh, regularly over the last 25 years, but the real reason for doing the book is not the biographical stuff in the front, it's the little essays in the back. Uh.
As I look around the room uh, behind you there, there's a, 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 a huge caricature, and it says something, a uh, honker home video. What's, yeah. what's that? It's another one of our little uh, cottage industries that we operate out of the house and out of a warehouse in the San Fernando Valley. You uh, are really quite an entrepreneur. I guess if, if people think of you in, in terms of, of, of being out of the mainstream, you really are in the mainstream in a lot of ways in, in the way you sort of conduct your, conduct your business. Well, I think it's mainstream and maybe even trendy today to be entrepreneurial. It's something else to stick with it and manage to earn a living from it. And that's one of the interesting things about my career is that doing things which are a little bit off the wall, I've managed to earn a living. Is, is it important to you to have control of all of that stuff yourself? Sure, because who else is going to take care of it? Nobody else would care about it. Can you get records made in this day and age? Can Frank Zappa make a re could Frank Zappa make a record for a big commercial record company and get it promoted? Well, that's just a matter of uh, cash and payoffs, actually. But you know, I can make any kind of record that I want. I have my own record company, and then that company is distributed through capital. But the deal that I have with them involves no promotion. They don't do anything but uh, press it and ship it out and then collect from the retailers. Yeah. You got a Grammy for Jazz from Hell. Is mm -hmm. it, does that mean anything extra to you? Uh, well, I think that it's a you know, living proof that the whole process is a fraud. This is a little plastic joke, uh, the, the Grammy itself. I got it for a song called Jazz from Hell, which I'm convinced nobody has ever heard. And I don't know why they gave me a Grammy for this song. It was the most obscure track on a, a CD called Jazz from Hell. Frank Zappa we're visiting with in the Hollywood Hills this morning. We will turn, return and talk some more. In just a bit. It's 15 minutes before the hour. Hollywood Hills and our visit at home with rock performer and composer Frank Zappa. We're in a different part of the house. Looks like you've got an entire studio set up there. That's right. You I'll make just walk over here. Yeah, Leo. Well, let's look around a little bit. Yeah. There, there's something you're sitting by now that uh, I'm not even sure how how to pronounce it. Can you explain it? Well, it's a machine called a Sinclair, which is uh, this is the machine that produced that Grammy award-winning song, "Jazz from Hell." <laughs> that some that everyone is humming on the way to work yeah. this morning. What what does the machine do? How does it work? Well, it allows you to um, per perform on the keyboard. You could play a composition on the keyboard, mm -hmm. which is then stored in the computer memory, and then you edit what you played, or you can type in information on this keypad here and uh, edit what you played. Now, did, does the computer in some way, shape, or form uh, uh, create musical voices? Uh, you know, I mean, can you do, you can do, I suppose, like trumpets or yeah. violins or whatever? Yeah, you can have any kind of instrument you want, and that's done through sampling. Yeah. Well, do you think uh, a Beethoven or a Brahms or a Mozart would compose this way if they had access to this kind of machinery? Well, if they didn't, they'd be missing out. It's a great machine, and it uh, allows you to do a lot of work fast. Yeah. It's like a word processor for music. Is there... Do you ever think, though, the stuff, the, the electronics and the, and, the, and the microchips can kind of get in the way, though, of the actual true music itself or, or, or what you're really trying to get at? No, actually, it improves it by subtracting the human element, which is the most real unreliable part of doing music. <laughs> if you've ever employed a musician, you know what I mean. <laughs> I thought that was supposed to be part of the uh, creative process, <clears throat> though. Employing musicians? Yeah. Well, no. <laughs> uh, you have worked with major symphonies. You've written lots of music. You've looked at the works and studied the works of... Uh, important modern composers. Is it important to you to be taken seriously in that regard? No. You've done that work though. When you work with those people, how does it feel to have them respond to you? work with a guy in a, in a tuxedo? <laughs> you know, it's kind of like going to a banquet except you don't eat. Well, except, isn't it something more than that? I mean, these people are real, these people are real artists. They're talking about people like a Zubin Mater or somebody like that. That's, that's well, of course, you know, you have to take the people as they come. Individual uh, 
conductors and performers can be uh, alternately charming or uh, boring. And just because a guy's got a tuxedo on is no sure sign that he's an artist or a fine person. And I've seen both kinds in the orchestral world. Same way in rock and roll, just because a guy's got a nice leather suit doesn't mean he can really rock. Who do you like? Who do you respect? Uh, give me a classification. Rock and roll. Um, well, I think my favorite guitar player working in rock and roll today would be uh, Alan Holdsworth. And who does he work with, for those of us who have... Who don't know? ...managed to age out of some, or lose we'll touch. Keep, we'll just keep that a secret. This, you know, <laughs> this, it's his group, Alan Holdsworth. And okay. Then what about, and, and what about classical music? In classical music, my favorite composers are Stravinsky, Webern, Bartok. Guys like that. Yeah. Are there any um, any people? Have you ever heard the music of like uh, the minimalists, or like uh, Philip Glass? Are you in touch with that sort of stuff? I've never heard a piece by Philip Glass, but in general, I don't like minimalist music. Do you? What do you listen to around the house? Uh, I don't have much recreational listening time. Basically, if I'm listening to something, I'm listening to what I'm working on in the studio. Yeah. You have uh, four kids. We see your son sometimes uh, on, on TV. Are you a good dad? I guess I'm okay. They're, none of the kids are in jail. <laughs> and uh, what's, do you have a philosophy, a, a, a parenting philosophy? Well, this is revealed in minute detail in the book, but I could sum it up for you, and you're probably not going to enjoy it. In the part that says how to raise fantastic children, the secret clue is keep them as far away from religion as possible. And that's that's the that's the key, you think, or what? What else? So wouldn't didn't you say you should let kids grow like weeds? Yeah, let them grow like weeds, but keep them away from a church. Let me make this very clear. What is choosing, it, what is, a, choosing a religion is important, okay? Right. And this is not something that should be inflicted on a child from birth. And I think that if you let a child choose which way he wants to go, which religion or no religion or whatever he wants to do, that decision should be made by the child at the point where the child has enough data to make that decision. Do you think, uh, do you want your kids to grow up to be musicians? If they want to. I think my daughter, the youngest daughter, is probably going to be more interested in mathematics. Frank Zappa, thanks so much for letting us come into your home and uh, visit with you this morning. Okay, Harry, see ya. Take care.